<laughs> Welcome to Ireland Unfiltered. This week's guest is Andrew Trimble. We'll go to that interview in a moment. And before we do, and before I go to Patrick Hoy, don't forget to subscribe to Ireland Unfiltered on all the usual channels. But now, here's Patrick Hoy, producer uh, of Ireland Unfiltered, not just producer in general. No. And uh, you're going to tell us about the competition. I come bearing gifts. Great. Okay, because as ever, not only do you get a fantastic interview in this show, but you get prizes, goodies. Fantastic. Um, they're all, as usual, thanks to Carlsberg Unfiltered, our show sponsor. And like this show, uh, Carlsberg Unfiltered is uh, a new cloudy pilsner. It's a lager that's stripped back, less processed, and with no filter for more natural taste. Um, they have given us a pair of tickets to all 10 um, gigs at Live at the Marquee Cork this summer. We're doing Live at the Marquee Cork for the last few shows because Kevin Fortune was the lucky winner of our first um, uh, our first competition, which was Live at the Mar- or Live at the Ivy Gardens gigs, right. excuse me. So this Live at the Marquee Cork, it's featuring acts like Tommy Tiernan, Christy Moore, Versatile, David Gray. There's around 10 in total. You get a pair of tickets to every single one of those. Uh, to find out how to win, stay tuned to this episode. I'll pop back in at the end and uh, tell you how you can be in with a chance. Thanks, Patrick. And now here's Andrew Trimble. Andrew Trimble, welcome to Ireland Unfiltered. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here, uh, moving a different part of the studio from where you normally are uh-huh. for House of Rugby. Yeah, disorientated. <laughs> are you, yeah? Uh-huh. Well, if you, if, you, if, you, you know, if you feel it uh, ill at ease any time, you can just retreat to the... Back to the sofa. Back to the sofa. Back to my comfort blanket. Of the Exa- sofa. Exactly. Um, you retired just under a year ago uh was there any when you announced your retirement was there any sense of relief oh absolutely yeah possibly yeah um someone said to me um you know you'll know when you know when the time's right you'll be very clear and uh undoubtedly i knew very clearly that it was time for me to move on and the the relief for me was instantaneous not having to just be concerned about performance being concerned about getting fit be concerned about selection bad performances team performances all this stuff and I was you know really looking forward to to moving on and and just trying something different and was it uh, like did it ever get easier that sense of stress and stuff you carried around games it I um, I was able to cope with it a lot better um, I think the more thorough my plan was and how my preparation was and if I was a lot more diligent about Taking all the boxes that I knew that would get me um, into a good position to be able to perform, then I could kind of slightly more be excited about mm. performance rather than that typical or that kind of the default position for me would have been concern about making mistakes. Yeah. Um, so I was able to just to deal with that a little bit just by being more thorough with my preparation. Again, a very much uh, uh, a lot of things I learned from being in, in the environment with Joe Schmidt. Mm. Just meticulous details and just making sure any problems on match day are dealt with um, by solutions in your plan mm. and uh, kind of very pragmatic um, way to approach performance not that sexy you know, yeah, yeah. You know not uh, your classic kind of maybe your French approach or your mm. South African approach where you're just your reliance and talent I find a way to manage my plan and get in a position where I was a lot more excited about performing rather than being dragged back by the concern of, of letting people down, or making mistakes or dropping balls. But did that feeling of that concern about letting people down, that drove you as well though? Like it was, it was an important <coughs> part of your kind of armory too. It, it drives you <coughs> to, to an extent, but it's it's a negative way to mm. to, to be motivated, I think. Um, it, it, it does, you get some value out of that, I think. You know that, I think even in the past, um, playing on Ulster sides where we've been underperforming and we've, Maybe um, 2012 might be a good example when mm. we went to, to uh, Thoman Park to play Munster in the quarterfinals. And there was an element of you're going to Thoman Park and knock out stages in the European Cup. If you don't turn up, you get, you could get absolutely hammered. So there's an element of fear yeah. uh, in that, that that kind of actually inspires a big performance. But more, more generally, I think those are the one-offs. I think generally um, it's, a lot, it's a lot more a positive approach to, to kind of look at your plan say listen I'm in a really good position here that can be quite a powerful tool for um, sitting uh, on game day just thinking I'm really well prepared here I'm really thoroughly prepared and looking forward to kind of showing off rather than mm. than that concern so I think that's a way more powerful tool to approach your performance um, 
but was it something like that you felt confident about talking about uh, that that this sense of you know that you used to worry about your performance because while I was reading about you there was a line from 2006 where Mark McCall said he'd never seen a player with as much self-belief as you <laughs> and like were you kind of pro projecting something at that stage do you think maybe um uh, I'm surprised that he said that maybe my early days whenever I broke through um you kind of don't have the the baggage that you end up having right. yeah, uh, yeah. as you get a little bit o older um I, I took my um daughter swimming there the last couple of weeks mm. and the last time she's two uh, on saturday mm. actually the last time i took her swimming was in the summer start of the summer mm -hmm. and she was loving loving yeah, it splashing yeah. around smiling giggling loving it because she hadn't been swimming in nine months or something then she was really um, uptight and mm. cried the whole time yeah, yeah. hated it it was an unpleasant experience yeah. for for both of us uh and i said to the instructor i was going i don't know what's like it's just been a wee while and she said well she's probably just a little bit older as well yeah. so you get a bit older then you get a bit more aware self-aware around you maybe that's an illustration of kind of how i felt maybe i got into my mid-20s and i realized kind of maybe what was expected of me how much attention there was on me and my teammates mm. and maybe you're young and naive and you're just you're just playing a sport that you've grown up playing with your mates yeah. when you're 19 and you're athletic you're naturally i was naturally mm. powerful and athletic you kind of rely on that a little bit more maybe that's what mark's referring to there and so you didn't have it when you were when you were a young player and coming through you did enjoy it for the sake you know, just enjoyed playing rugby did yeah, you? yeah i think it did i think it did um uh, it's it's nice feeling young and fresh and uh i mean back then it was Self and Tommy in the two wings for Ulster, and mm. it was it was a case of put the ball in the hands of myself and Tommy, and Ulster designed moves to to give us the ball, and right, yeah. you know it, it was it was nice knowing that your teammates kind of believed in you, and you were I was I was faster and probably more athletic mm. then than I've ever been, and after that then injuries start to set in, and um, uh, doubts start to set in, you know, mm. and uh, kind of again maybe that awareness as you mature a little bit. You kind of have to find a new way to approach your performance um, and move away from that young, fresh, naive. Sure, we're just playing a game of rugby. Yeah, yeah. I've always been good at rugby. Why don't I just go out and throw the ball away? That doesn't last that long, mm. I don't think. Um, and were you apprehensive about retiring at all? Like in the other side of it, what you were going to do? <sighs> Not really, no. to be honest. Um, uh I was quite excited about yeah. doing something different, even though I wasn't completely sure what that was going to be. Um, uh, I have been working on a, a technology solution yeah. um, probably for about a year and a half before I finished up. So the timing was right for me mm. to, if, if I had been in a, an established career, it would have been a lot more risky to have put that to one side and start this technology mm. uh, business. But what is that? It's um, uh, it's called Keros Keros mm. Sports Technology. Yeah. So, um, we're we're developing a, a platform for elite sports teams, professional professional sports teams, to allow athletes in sports teams to be a bit more pragmatic, be a bit more planned, a bit more organised, and uh, um, kind of streamline their plan okay. and allow them to be a bit more single minded, perform with more clarity, more certainty. Right. Um, so that's our big kind of vision. Mm what that actually means on the ground is that they they break up their uh, performance into components and uh, there's a medical component there's a rehab component there's a even a, a scheduling component there's a strength and conditioning mm -hmm. component skills component all these different areas of your game and it's you what we're doing is we're kind of making a science of performance again it's very much a lot of the stuff that i learned as right, i went through my yeah. career uh, you make a science of performance rather than that young naivety relying mm. on talent you kind of engineer a performance uh, and you own it yourself and you kind of take a lot more responsibility and it's quite a powerful tool uh, you get to match day and you've um, planned out your schedule you planned out your skills okay. contribution for that week you've set your targets in your snc you've got everything in front of you in your app and um, on match day um, keros k-a-i-r-o-s it's greek the Greeks had two ways of telling time. They had Kronos and Keros. Mm. Kronos, apparently, this has been explained to me. <laughs> okay, you're sounding very authoritative about yeah. it anyway. Uh, yeah. um, so <laughs> Kronos like, okay, is, he knows what he's talking Kronos about. is your, is your um, like chronological time, <coughs> yeah, yeah. time as we know it. Keros is, um, it's been described in um, 
million different ways but it's like outside of time or the opportune moment or okay. a moment that sits outside of time so the way we the way we imagine this kind of this concept that we're trying to harness for the, the um the app is whenever you're getting ready to run out with your teammates um you're in keros you're in the moment and you've done all your planning you've done all your preparation you've mm. ticked every box and it's a really powerful tool for rationally reassuring yourself that you're ready to perform um because in the past whenever i didn't operate with the same mindset i would have been asking myself have i done this this week have i done enough high ball reception right, yeah, have i done enough okay. skills did i hit my targets in my gym early in the week you know this kind of mm. stuff have i even had a massage of my calves so my calves don't cramp stuff mm. like this some of it can be superstitious but um whenever you get to match day if you've ticked every box it's a really powerful tool to kind of remind yourself you're ready it's really likely that you're going to perform today so yeah. multiply that by 15 and you get 15 big performances mm -hmm. so that's one of the things you had in you know for a life after play mm -hmm. um did you have and have you had to develop the same kind of arc in retirement about you know starting off with doubts about things and worrying about things you did and then <coughs> developing a confidence that you could enjoy it more um i i haven't been that um anxious about um life after rugby have you to not? be honest um again from speaking to guys mm. i find this the whole area quite interesting because yeah. it's so unique not that many people um pivot into a new career in their mid-30s yeah. so i'm trying to see it as an opportunity mm. um but yeah so i've obviously chatted to a lot of guys who were in the same boat as me maybe a year ago and there's a f few guys have kind of fed back that you can be naive for a year and it could take a while to hit you and certainly there's one or two things i miss i miss the crack i miss the mm. lads i miss that security i miss that identity a little bit okay um but i don't miss playing one bit right not i don't miss training yeah. don't miss playing don't i don't miss the stress um and uh for those reasons saying goodbye to that those mm. stresses and being excited about a new type of stress of course with a startup but excited about something that I'm quite passionate about. But like when you're doing, like you did a live show for House of Rugby in Belfast last night, when you're doing that, are you apprehensive? Do you worry about it? Do you think about it a lot beforehand? Um, it's, uh, I, I did a, a master's, um, I, I studied theology and undergrad in theology mm. and, uh, and, I, and I struggled with it. I'm going to answer your question here, this is a long way. <laughs> okay. uh, and it took me seven years to finish it. I wasn't that good at it. I kind of um, grinded it out and got mm. it done and did okay. Um, but it was something I was always I wasn't really that good at, so I had to try quite hard to yeah. get average results. Right. And then um, last uh, December, sorry, 2017, I graduated with a an MSc in finance, mm. and finance would be something that would kind of come more naturally to me. Yeah. And studying as a mature student is a lot easier, even with two kids at home. <laughs> um, obviously, managing that time a little bit is tricky, but. Yeah. Um, finance to me so something came naturally to me but it was also something that i had no I, i'd had no finance hadn't done any finance exams mm. or anything so something was completely different as well and the fact that I, I i took it on i i felt like i did well at it and i felt comfortable and uh it was a big lesson learned for me that i sh i didn't want to be afraid of doing new stuff right and uh i don't know i'm i'm starting to answer yeah, your you're question getting there, yeah. <laughs> yeah but that was a real lesson to me and i've, I've come back to that a few times and said said myself if i can do something that's totally new to me mm. and do well at it then i need to take a lot of confidence from that and um you know stuff like the podcast or the presenting or media stuff mm. it's gonna take work you know but i'm excited about it because i i kind of starting to back myself yeah, yeah. starting to feel like i can do this stuff and uh, i know that's not very irish right yeah, to yeah, kind yeah. of back yourself you know yeah. and, and be confident but i'm sort of learning more and more that if you don't back yourself then no one else will so that's um i applied that concept to to the media and the podcast and the presenting and stuff and um uh, like the the live show we did last mm. night in belfast of course i'm nervous mm. I've, I've done uh this is my oh, really my second live show yeah, yeah. of course i'm nervous but sure what's the worst could happen <laughs> it's not like a rugby game it's not exactly yeah, yeah. you're not going to get a score out of 10 <laughs> in the paper the next day <laughs> well, no there's probably people there there's probably people you know heckling you and yeah. saying bad things about you there was a bit of heckling on last night actually was yeah. <laughs> it was very polite though it was, was, it? It was kind heckling right so your home crowd heckling yeah one person said um, you could never pass with your left 
Or something. <laughs> right. what, a, what a burn. Yeah, no. Ooh, ouch. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. If that's the worst. Holding on to that one. Yeah. When I see that trimble, I'll tell him. Yeah, I just pretended they were talking to Barry anyway. <laughs> right, so, okay. yeah, he took that one. <laughs> um, take me back then to, like, you talked about, you know, you were good at maths gro- at school and stuff like that. Were you, like, you growing up, like, what was your childhood like? You had two sisters. Yeah, I had two sisters. They were um, five and six years older than me, okay. so I did a, a lifestyle piece for, I can't remember what the paper was, mm. and we did something like this, and uh, I know just before we came on air, we were talking about not trusting people, not <laughs> opening up in press conferences, and that classic um, yeah. thing that Richie Sadler and I chatted yeah. about as well, about how you actually don't say anything, and if you don't say anything, then you can't cock up, yeah, yeah. so that's that's a win yeah. for rugby guys. <laughs> but anyway, on this occasion, I opened up a little bit and um, stupidly I said, um, eh, I've got two sisters, they're five and six years old, older than me, there's a bit of a gap. And I said, I think I'm a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and we talked for about an hour and that was the headline, Andrew, I'm a mistake. And I had my mom on the phone <laughs> saying, you're not a mistake, you know, we're like we, we planned you, you know, and we love you. We love you. So anyway, so that was my upbringing. I um, two older sisters um, who um, uh, bullied me. Yeah. Really? Yeah. No, they looked after me. Um, but you were, that's a, it's a quite a big age gap. They were like, they yeah. were close together in age and then you were, you were the mistake that came along. Yeah, yeah. I was uh, the afterthought. I think um, uh, dad was keen just to get a, okay. a wee boy, get a rugby player. Right. Um, dad loves his rugby. Mum and dad have always been unbelievably supportive. Mum can't, could never watch games. Really, she would go to the games, yeah. and then she would just she just can't sit there, can't sit mm. still. She'd be just spending the time walking around ro- around by the like the food vans, or just keeping herself away from the game. And, uh, and where and, did they meet? So they met. Um, they met at Floral Hall, which is um, at a at a dance. Okay. <laughs> um, back in the day in North Belfast, right um, on the Antrim Road, actually where the zoo is now. Right. Apparently. Um, my wife um, laughs at me because I never know any of this stuff, and it's only whenever she comes around and she would actually ask some questions. Okay, you would never even th- I would never even think to ask my dad where I where I met my uh, my mum or her. Yeah, you yeah. know because don't know and where are they they both from Belfast. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he he played uh, rugby for Academy, which mm. is uh, BRA old boys, and then coached there as well. So. Loved his rugby. Don't think my granddad played any rugby, so I think dad was the first kind of rugby influence. Okay. And then, uh, yeah, he loved his rugby. He brought me along to my first game was um, the Barbarians against South Africa at Lansdowne in 96. Right. Um, so, yeah, that was me. Played mini rugby. Loved it. Dad was the coach. Okay. So, and then it's kind of going full circle now. My wee fellas, uh, be four in the summer, yeah. so it will not be long till I'm doing the, the mini rugby thing and, are you looking forward to that? I am, yeah. yeah, yeah. I am, yeah. It's uh, it's a cool wee stage actually. Jack's gonna be four in mm. the summer. Molly turns two next this week, and uh, and we've number three in the way in June. Okay, congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so it's busy. You know, yeah, yeah. the two of them are great crack at the minute. Yeah. Uh, so we're going back to back to the start again. And you feel happy? Like I've my son is gonna be five next week, and he's you know playing football now. Well, he's you know playing around, but he just wants yeah. to. Uh, play football with me like two kids two French kids I think they were over for the game came along in the park were a bit older last week and wanted to play uh-huh. and the minute they scored the first goal he just started crying and wanted yeah. to go home you know? yeah. so it's yeah. like you know you could be like we're going to go very gently yeah. into this but you would be happy you're going to be happy kind of playing rugby with him him playing rugby things yeah. like that I'm not sure I mean it's very early but I'm not sure if, if rugby would be for him yeah he's um, he's 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 quite, he's a wee bit of a softy, you right. know. His wee sister bullies him a bit. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, she she probably play rugby and yeah. say, yeah. yeah, but um, they're so different, the two of them. <coughs> yeah, that, that I know that's been debated a good bit um, recently with kind of concussions and mm. injuries and stuff. And I can imagine I'll be maybe similar to my mum in that, yeah. uh, you know, I'll be obviously, you know, very, very concerned about you know the collisions and the, mm. the size of guys and the um, the impact and the injuries and all that. Did um, you find that an issue because you're not like you know the players are getting bigger and like you're strong and you're athletic but you're not a 
you know, you're kind of more like a classical kind of back rather than, you yeah. know, you see these days players <coughs> in all positions are a certain kind of heft. Yeah. Did you find that tricky as you, as you got older? Uh, yeah, yeah. Like it, physically, it, mm. is, it is tough to kind of compete. And um, uh, I probably I would have been um, a little bit more kind of physically dominant, a little bit more athletic, mm. a little bit more powerful when I was a youngster. Right. Um, so, and again, that naivety, you, you don't, you're not concerned about the size of guys because you don't really think about it. Yeah. As you get older, as you become, as I became, when I became a dad, actually, right. I, c I became a lot more concerned about making sure that, um, you know, if I had a back injury, finished with a back injury and had an mm. operation in August, just a disc, um, that got shaved off, mm. and it sat with it was probably six months, nine months, I had that back injury and sciatica down down one yeah. side, and and. It did. It did definitely cross my mind. I was thinking, if this is something that impacts my life in any way, right, I'd be devastated. You know, even just like as you said, like kicking a ball with a young fella, yeah, yeah. playing golf, but mo mostly hanging out with the kids yeah. and doing stuff with the kids. If that was to be impacted, it'd be massive. You know, mm. it'd be such a, you know, it'd be such a high price to pay for playing rugby for a few years. Having said that, and I always kind of want to balance it because I think the reason why I am who I am and I met the people I met and I had the experiences I did and um, I'm so thankful that I got a chance to play rugby not just for rugby's sake mm. but because of all the stuff that comes with rugby the type of people I met mm. they just shaped me and changed me and influenced me and I'm very very thankful that I had that and for me to say to my young fella um, it's too dangerous to sport yeah, yeah. I don't want you to play then I'd be denying him the opportunity mm. to have the same influences that I had I love the sport and I love the people yeah, I, yeah. Uh, that I met through it. Best friends, great experiences. That's all really, really significant. And, you know, it is, it's worth a little bit of a risk mm. physically to pick up a couple of injuries. That's fine for the benefits, I think, that, that young people are getting. I'm going to jump back in a minute, but I just want to ask you something <clears throat> there. Were you looking forward? Were you excited about becoming a father for the first time? Or did the <coughs> feelings you have, which are, you know, did they take you by surprise a little bit? Uh, I was I was looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, had I known how how tough it was going <laughs> to be, <laughs> I, I might have been so uh, like looking forward to it quite so much. Right. Um, yeah. It's uh, <laughs> it is exhausting. Yeah. It's tough. Um, and it's it's tough as well to kind of maintain, um, like you know, lifestyle of a professional yeah. rugby player, any professional athlete. Just trying to stay fresh, trying to eat mm. well, trying to sleep well, is kind of you have to compromise. Yeah. Something has to um, has to give, and it, it definitely compromises your performance a bit, but it also um, makes your kind of mindset a little bit more holistic. Yeah, as well, which probably it probably doesn't benefit uh, you as a rugby player. But yeah, I I was looking forward to it. I think um, uh, I I'm looking forward to more like the the next. I was always looking forward to the next stage. Right. When when Jack can do more. Yeah, and yeah. Play more, and he'll. Um, you know, he can be more interactive and he's a classy stage now and he's yeah. really chatty and um, funny and he just some of the stuff he comes out with is brilliant, you know. Mm. Um, I think um, uh, women just, just love that newborn bit yeah, and yeah. men just enjoy the next wee bit, the next wee stage. Yeah, yeah. You can get a bit more crack out of them. I know, I know. You can throw them about a bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they're funny and they're fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so growing up then, your mother played, was a tennis player. Yes. Uh, yeah. And uh, did you, you play, did you play all sports? Yeah, I played tennis. Uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know how much um, my mom spent on uh, tennis coaching. Right. Okay. <laughs> Waste of money. <laughs> tennis coaching and elocu el elocution. Okay. Those were her two yeah. big influences. And she says she wasted all that money. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she'll text me if she watches this and if I say uh, me and Barry. Okay. She'll text me and she'll say, Barry and I. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, grammar, not great. Right. And what did she do? Um, uh, she um, worked at Halifax for a while. Okay. And she worked as an administrator in the church. Um, yeah. Then she worked um, uh, for Balmoney Borough Council as, okay. a, as an administrator or a PA. Um, so, unbelievably well organized. Mm. Like, that you come into the house and she, she'll come into the house and if she's looking after the kids for a weekend if she comes down if we get away for a weekend or something she'll come in the kids will be in bed there'll be food made for a week the place will be spotless <laughs> she's an absolute machine yeah yeah 
so much so that with this um technology company that we've started i think um, we could maybe get her involved actually <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> yeah she'd, she'd have everybody be into shape <laughs> yeah no she's um unbelievably well organized okay. and she puts us to shame yeah and so she was she was pushing tennis on you but rugby yeah. was the thing that i did play tennis for a good while yeah. and I, w- I was never that good okay um but me and a couple of buddies in school played and we enjoyed it so mm. that was about the height of it i mean i, I entered i think my mom and dad just wanted to keep me busy all summer and now being a parent i would like to keep my kids yeah, yeah. busy all summer yeah, yeah. um for two reasons because it's good for them but also get them out of your hair yeah. right uh, having said that, it was mum driving me to tennis competitions or leprechaun rugby mm. or there was an athletics um, week in the summer. It was more or less every week in the summer yeah. I was doing something. I must have competed in probably 10, 12, 14 uh, tennis mm. tournaments. And I think I got through the first round once. Okay. So I was really? okay. pretty crap. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And this is in, you were growing up in Coleraine? <coughs> yeah. And uh, and you went to school there and you played rugby at school. Yeah. And were kind of a school star, were you? for? Uh, I was, yeah, I was not a star, I wouldn't say, but um, I felt, like I, I just felt fairly dom- dominant in yeah, school. Yeah. You know, got the ball and just lo- loved schools rugby. Schools rugby is one of those um, times whenever you're playing. Schools rugby and under 20, we were 21s, mm. under 20s rugby. Everybody's at the same stage. Everybody's good mates. And then, obviously, in school, then we'd grown up playing together. Mm. We didn't go great in the school's cup now, but, um, yeah, school's rugby's brilliant. I love school's rugby. Loved. Um, I, 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 f- I just felt great. I felt like I just want to get the ball in my hand. And mm. rugby was easy whenever you're um, just a little bit, like, a kind of decent performer. And yeah. I felt like I, I was, you know, faster than a lot of guys, more physical than a lot of guys. And just, it's a lot more fun mm. <laughs> playing like that. And was there a pathway then for you kind of mapped out? Like, did you know what you kind of wanted to do and where you were going to go? I I, I always wanted to be a professional rugby player yeah. anyway, yeah. And and play for Ulster? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I um, left school, studied physics for a year. Mum and dad mm. told me that would be a good idea. And it didn't really bother me. So I, I did that for a year, changed to theology. At the same time, I was in the, the National Academy. Back mm. then, it wasn't provincial. It was National Academy. And um, just trained away with that. Started getting good gains. Started playing well for Balamina. And then got a, I got a development contract. Mark McCall um, mm. was the coach at Ulster at the time. He gave me a development contract. And I really, I, de- I definitely don't think I deserved a development contract uh, mm. based on the way I was playing. I was playing okay. Um, but there were guys in there who were probably better than me um but he gave me one because he i think he saw a bit of potential in me and mm. he also thought that it would be good for me to be in that environment because i was quite shy whenever i came through right at okay. the start i was quite quietly spoken kind of mm. kept myself to myself and he thought this would be good for andrew to be in this environment to be surrounded by to be surrounded by david humphreys and justin harrison mm. and, you know these guys that i was looking up to is it true your dad had brought back a signed picture of david humphreys yes. for you yeah yeah he did so yeah. like he was a hero for you david humphreys yeah, yeah massively yeah uh that was surreal enough actually because then um I managed to get in the ulster squad and um you know i was training with david humphreys mm. and then broke through started playing for ulster started playing for ireland and that autumn 2000 and uh, 2005 it would have been mm. I just um, David Humphreys had his M3 at the time and I felt like he, he wanted to kind of show off his M3 <laughs> to the young fellas yeah. so he took myself and Tommy out for our spins and stuff yeah. you know it was it was quite you know, he put his arm around us a yeah, bit yeah, yeah. looked after us and uh, he was a real kind of role model I remember mm. him saying to me my first game in the run up to the game he said just take a minute you know it was the old Lansdowne Road against Australia and he said just if you get a chance if there's a break and play just take a minute and have a look around and mm. just kind of be in the moment mm. and enjoy that and i thought that's really really good advice because now looking back i wonder if i if i enjoyed every moment as much as i could have but um i remember david humphreys he was always looking after myself and tommy and O'Gara i used to slag him he said where's daddy and the two kids going today <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> typical raj yeah yeah <laughs> um but I was just wondering something I would ask you there and, and maybe jump back a bit as well, but there was a line about in an interview you gave about settling into the Irish team and you said, I always had the respect of my Ulster teammates. I just couldn't transfer my performance. Maybe I felt a little bit out of it in Dublin. 
Now, was there a, did you feel, and I was interested earlier when you said, you know, it's not a very Irish thing to uh, to talk yourself or to back yourself. Uh-huh. Like, what would you have described your identity as growing up? Would you have said you were Irish? Um, I remember um, whenever, I, whenever I was a youngster, like say youngster, I was maybe 10, 11, 12, mm. and someone asked me if I was a Catholic or a Protestant. Yeah. And I said I didn't know. Because I genuinely didn't know. Okay. And uh, and that that's something that was an environment that I was raised right. in. Yeah. And I I really appreciate that because yeah. I was sheltered from it from any kind of political religious chat. Yeah. And I had a naivety that I'm really thankful that I had. And, and where I, did that? How did your parents manage to do that? I don't know. I suppose. Uh, um. I really don't know. Mm. I don't know if there's a magic formula to it, but I just really liked that. I was completely indifferent. And, and who uh, asked, where were you asked that? By a mate of one of, one of my mm. best mates okay. um, now. Uh, and he thought he was a smart arse. He thought he was a bit clever because he knew he was a Protestant and he was asking if I was. Right. <laughs> like, he didn't care either. Yeah, yeah. But he was just, he thought, he, he he knew something that I didn't. Maybe, you know, the way kids get on. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so I said I didn't know. And I went home and asked mum and dad, am I Catholic or Protestant? Yeah. <laughs> And and uh, they're like, right, don't worry about it. Okay, right. <laughs> uh, and then I think that mindset, I've, I've kind of maintained that. Yeah. And uh, and it's nice to have a bit of balance in that. You know, I've got I've got both passports. Yeah. Uh, and I know there's, you know, all sorts of chat going on at the minute. It's just Brexit, left, right, yeah, center. Yeah. Um, and I just, I just like to, um, maintain a little bit of different uh, distance. Mm. from 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 all of it and i like to be i like to be all things to all men that's why i suppose i like that i played for ireland but I also play for ulster and i like that i've got a lot in common with a lot of different people yeah uh, and that's that's important to me but is it a so like, i didn't ask i did not you, you didn't question answer my question at all, at all. it's really both, good uh, you both, know, both both um but you wouldn't but clearly it wouldn't have been something that mattered hugely to you yeah which i don't like i don't think there's i think it's quite a good thing i think to probably yeah we, we could we could all do when you talk about brexit and you talk about it, like we could all do with people who these labels mattered a little less to uh-huh. because what's the uh what's the purpose of you know you look at brexit and you look at what's happening in britain and a country that's kind of tearing itself apart over mm-hmm sort of notions of labels. Na- labels and nationalism and taking back control and all yeah. these things that aren't going to make any difference yeah really accepting you know they'll get their they'll, they'll have their blue passports yeah so like when you say you're taking a step away from it i think it's actually an important it's not a it's not an apolitical statement in some ways if you like because yeah. it's actually saying this is this is a this is a, an important way and there are many people in northern ireland who are living, who believe, or who fo- who kind of approach life the same way you do? Yeah. And the unfortunate thing there as well is that the people who shout loudest That's exactly what yeah don't have that mindset. No, exactly. The people that shout the loudest are the the um kind of both both extremes. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's the kind of more moderate, more balanced uh, opinion that that kind of gets drowned out, I suppose. Yeah. I just um, gave a speech there about Brexit. I tend to do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I mean, I know you asked me the question, like British or Irish, yeah. and I said both. And some people probably say it's dodging the question, but you know, I, I don't. But really it never care. felt like that to you. No, I. I, I <coughs> but it never mattered to you. It really. never mattered. I never really yeah. cared. Um, uh, and I know in uh, O'Driscoll's documentary, mm. shoulder to shoulder, he was astounded. You know about a couple of guys he met. Who said they support Ireland? They're British. They're Northern Irish. They're Irish. They're, mm. You know, they're everything. And I think Brian was kind of making the point where well, you can't, you can't have everything. But I like to think we can. <laughs> <Right>. Okay, <laughs> we can have everything. That's yeah. the solution. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's it's um, it's just easier that way. Yeah, but you didn't see there was no like if there are contradictions, they're minor contradictions, and they're not really. But your point was you wanted to play rugby for Ireland. Uh-huh. You saw nothing. Uh, I saw no issue with that no. at all. And did you become more aware of it when you started playing? When you came to Dublin, did you feel to get? W- did you become any more uh, self conscious about things? I, I became aware of how um, how different culturally it is in Belfast than it is in Dublin. Okay. Now it's probably the same Limerick or Dublin, mm. but 
um, there's expressions, um, the way people talk. There's, you know, it's just it's it's so different. Yeah. Um, and even there be, you know, even on the podcast and stuff, there be references that that I wouldn't get because yeah. it would be Irish media or yeah, yeah. Irish influences, and you know, you know, I'd mainly be BBC or whatever up mm. north. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but apart from that. And um, do you think did you find people were curious about you or would ask you things or would or yeah would you people would ask yeah, yeah. People, people would ask like um, what kind of things well that that kind of stuff you <coughs> know um, people would kind of be, be interested uh, again people would be kind of just asking little little you know be tentatively asking questions you know concerned about offending me but yeah, interested yeah. to find out about somewhere that's just up the road but that culturally is just completely different yeah and they did you think they didn't know much about it a wee bit yeah. yeah yeah i find that actually quite a bit a lot of people um down in dublin or down south wouldn't even have because i'm i'm of, from Coriam, mm. spent a lot of time in port shirt port rush mm. myself and uh, my wife we, we would go up and um, up to the coast we would place in port shirt we would go up mm. a good bit love port shirt people down here it's like port shirt's not even on their radar yeah. the north coast is beautiful yeah I don't know if anybody's done the like the Game of Thrones tours mm. or like Bally Castle in right there, Bush Mills, all that. It's a beautiful part of yeah, the world, yeah. part of Ireland. And it's almost like it's 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 almost like our little secret. Yeah, yeah. People down here they go to the West Coast, they go Galway, they go Clare. It's not on their radar. It's not on their radar, yeah. I think um, we kinda get forgotten about it a little bit. Yeah. My my grandmother was uh she was Presbyterian from Ross Trevor uh-huh. and she ended up marrying uh, uh a Catholic from the south, and they settled in Tralee. Uh-huh. Uh, and she's Tralee was a big kind of you know IRA town back uh-huh. then, so uh, she was um, a real oddity. But she used to kind of provoke people. She used to pr- plant red hot pokers, which are those really orange flowers. Uh-huh. She would plant them to bloom in July, the uh-huh. twelfth of July. Oh, so brilliant. you'd have these things out. She'd be talking about Ian Paisley and these kind of things. But she kind of became this sort of. Uh, like she she settled there and loved it, but she always was aware of that sense of uh, she was in, like, and she would play up to that. But like she was a sense of like she was this creature that they had no uh, knowledge of or where she came from was somewhere. They, she might have as well come from another planet as far as people. Yeah. In Tralee now, Tralee is a long, you know, a lot further than Dublin, but still yeah. it was, uh, um, you know, it was the same island. It was the same country. Yeah. And people knew nothing about it. Yeah, but it's mad how, how you can grow up in one area and uh, like I mean, there's places about in Belfast where people are raised and they just they just there's a community just right mm. a stone throw away, and they just wouldn't have any familiarity with it. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah. It's mad how that's the case, and obviously that's Ross Trevor and Tralee. Mm. But as you say, on the same island, but just totally different. Mm. Um, culturally, the, the conversations, the type of people, the um, it's it it's something I think to kind of celebrate as well that diversity and um, I, having said that, um, I mean Barry Barry is a good example mm. on the podcast. You know, like completely different upbringings, but an awful lot in common. Yeah, exactly yeah. the same sense of humor. You know, and how does that happen? And I find that with loads of the guys in the mm. squad as well. Loads of guys who. I would say it'd be very, very good friends of mine now, and um, that's uh, that's 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 nice to have that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And tell me about your uh, your um, debut for for Ireland because you came on. Uh, there was, was there, there was what was you came on for Brian O'Driscoll? Did you or you? Yeah. Okay. Um, I had never met Brian at this stage. Mm. Um, I'm not sure I met. I think I met him after then. I made my debut. There's obviously after the summer where he got um, dumped by Umanga, mm. um, shoulder dislocated, so he was out of the autumn. Yeah, yeah. Um, then I started playing for Ulster, played in Europe, then made my debut against mm. uh, Australia. But I was wearing 13 on my back, and um, obviously, you know, I, I, I felt a little bit of a weight of expectation yeah. for what uh, is usually the kind of output <laughs> from <laughs> someone in that position. And... Um, so I already felt that pressure mm. a little bit, be my first game, and then replacing O'Driscoll is a is a big ask. But in the run up to the game, there was a there was a fire in the terrace on the end of the pitch underneath. Mm. Apparently, so it, structurally it wasn't sound. 
So they didn't allow any spectators into the terrace. Mm. So instead of having spectators, they didn't want it to leave it empty. They put up a massive banner of O'Driscoll <laughs> on the end of the ground. <laughs> and I went, you're just heaping on more pressure here. That's the guy who I'm trying to, you know, fill the shoes up. Yeah. Um, and I don't think I'd met Brian at that stage, but I met him shortly afterwards anyway. And uh, but was so were you aware of it through the game? You were aware of this big this big banner there. Yeah, I well I forgot about it once the game started, but yeah, it was just a nice little reminder of how much pressure there was. And was there? Did you find it difficult coming into that like uh, that setup where there were kind of established players like Leinster, Munster, big players like that? Was that something that was difficult for you? Yeah, um, so I said to you um, before about how Mark McCall got me into that environment because yeah. he felt like I needed to be surrounded by that environment and mm. kind of find my feet a little bit, maybe just mature a little bit, I suppose. Um, so I felt like then I, I did. I was kind of able to be myself and kind of come out of my shell a little bit. Mm. Um, and then you go down to Ireland and then you kind of have to start again yeah. because as, as daunting as uh, David Humphreys and Justin Harrison are, then you go down there and you've got... O'Driscoll, O'Gara, O'Connell mm. and then it's another level and you kind of, kind of got to get to know these guys and be teammates of theirs and these are guys who I looked up to and admired um, so yeah then it took me a little bit to find my feet down there I think that's the period where you're you're talking about mm. where I felt really comfortable playing for Ireland sorry really comfortable yeah. playing for Ulster would go out there not really give it a second thought um, as a youngster just go out play rugby play with the lads I know really well play with mm. Tommy um, and uh, and just enjoy that and then go down to Ireland and just feel a little bit more pressure a little bit more expectation mm. a little bit more uncomfortable uh, which ultimately was good for me I think but for a while it um, it makes it difficult to, to be yourself or to, to thrive like it would have for Ulster and why do you think it was good for you ultimately? Um, well I, I mentioned before there how I, a number of times that I've, I've made myself uncomfortable yeah yeah and then you become a little bit more comfortable in mm. that environment and uh so if, had i never been exposed to that as a as a youngster mm. um that that big occasion big international games against australia in the autumn six nations as a 21 year old mm. had i not got exposed to that th that early then i might not got used to it and i mightn't have kind of found my feet and mm. started to kind of thrive like i did um and you had opportunities to leave Ulster, did you? To go abroad? Uh, one or two, but nothing nothing realistic. Right. There was never a point where I was I was really tempted. I did go to, to Paris at one stage to, to visit um, Stade Francais. That would have been a massive mistake in the end because the following season was the season when Joe Schmidt mm. arrived and, and then I kind of found my groove a little bit and mm. got on a run where I was just I felt really confident was performing really well and we won the Six Nations that year so uh, it turned out Stade Francais didn't want me either <laughs> they were just they were just keeping me hanging on because um, Dick Bioani the Australian winger he was kind of hemming in hand I found yeah. this out afterwards okay. <laughs> so I, I was there on insurance <laughs> so you were just in case that you I was there just it. in case yeah <laughs> And that was the only upper, like real chance, was it? Or it wasn't even a chance it turned out? Uh yeah, that was really the only that was the only time I went and visited a club. Yeah. Realistically thinking that this was an option. And would you have been interested in it? Yeah. I well actually sorry, I tell a lie. Um I I nearly went to um I nearly continued and played on for another year in, okay. in South of France and um uh, second division side called uh, Aix in Provence. Mm. James Collin, uh, the Munster eight, has just got a, a job as a forwards coach there right. with Jamie Cudmore, the the Claremont second row, mm. the Canadian guy, as a head coach. Um, but there was a lot of uh, guys changing, changing over and stuff. And then the backs coach, who was interested in signing me, moved to another club um, in nowhere near as nice an, an area. <laughs> um, my my wife's um, dad is French, okay. so. We can have a we, we always had a wee bit of an inkling. Right. It would be cool to do for a year or two, and yeah. that would have been a nice time to to go away, nice weather, mm. play a bit of nice rugby. But physically, it just wasn't really up to it. Yeah, and then it just wouldn't have been the same experience. So yeah, we we canned it. And where did you meet your wife? I I met her. We did a a team together when uh, when we were youngsters. Um, we went to South Africa and did a like a summer team, like a mission team. Mm went into the townships and played like cricket oh, and football okay. and rugby with um, 
uh, the kids in the township. We did that for a couple of weeks, and then we became friends. And then a few years later, she was she was young. <laughs> she was quite young. Okay, <laughs> I was nineteen. She was sixteen. Right. And then a couple of years later, we started dating, and um, that was us. And that was when you get what age when you got married? Uh, twenty four. Okay. And the third kid on the way. Yeah. Um, uh-huh. And does that take like was was rugby uh, a strain on her because you said like there's a lot you know you you know when kids come along especially it's it's exhausting but you clearly had to sort of say well I have to rest for yeah exactly you know, rugby. no I know I know she'll probably watch this and say why were you tired yeah yeah <laughs> um, so anyway she yeah I think I think rugby did take its toll on her as well mm. although. Um, she loved it as well and she loved me being involved and she loved the people that she met through it as well yeah, yeah, again yeah. that whole kind of um all of all the amazing things about the sport and the people mm. and the culture and, and all that mm. was amazing for both of us and we had some great experiences met some great people and, and just shared some great memories having said that since i retired we both felt um as if we're we're both felt like we're really really pleased that we're, we're not doing it anymore yeah. Uh, even on Sunday, we went down to the game. I was we were gonna go down just the two of us. Mm. The kids looked after and go down, spend the weekend in Dublin mm. <coughs> for the friends, uh, the France game, and uh, and then a couple of weeks before, and I said, "Come on, we'll bring Jack down to his first game." Okay. And I was like, "Well, Jack, if he takes my ticket, then I." <laughs> so I had to do like a, a, a corporate thing at, <laughs> right, at, <okay. laughs> at the game. Otherwise, I wouldn't have got okay. into the game. So, yeah. um, but that was that was so nice. Yeah. going down spend the night going out for a nice meal spend the night Jack thought it was all exciting because he mm. was having a sleepover in mummy and daddy's room yeah, yeah. and uh, and then Anna said on the Sunday morning she she said you know the boys will be so stressed today you know they're they're going to be they're going to be looking forward to the game anticipating there's a lot of heat in Ireland at the minute mm. off the back of the England yeah. loss and she just goes you're not just so glad we're not doing that anymore yeah. and I couldn't agree more I would hate to be just she always she always thought that I got really weird on match day. Really, yeah. Just I would I just f- always felt this weight of expectation or anxiety around the mm. game. Um, again, I felt again to draw on what I talked about earlier. I found ways of coping with that better, yeah. but still. He, but were you difficult for people? Because you seem like such a easygoing, affable guy. Yeah, it's just it's it's always. It's just always it's always in the back of your mind i have to perform tonight i have to do this that, the other i have to remember the calls i have to but how would it manifest itself in your, in so your she, relationship with her um she thought that i would just go quiet i would kind of mm. go into my shell a little bit mm. um I, I i would agree that's definitely how i mm. would perceive it as well having said that um at, at ulster anyway we would um go for lunch you know with a couple of guys if it was a friday night yeah. game we go and get lunch with the lads and if you share that time, that match day, that weird period, mm. as my wife would call it, if you share that with guys that you're going to share the pitch with, yeah. and they're going through the exact same stuff, I would be completely normal because yeah, I felt yeah. like we're all in it together. Right. We're all experiencing the same stuff. We all understand mm. what we're kind of going through. So that that was my experience of it. I don't know if other guys would say the same, but I was totally normal when I was with the lads who I was sharing that with. Yeah. When I go home to Anna or someone else who was like an outsider, who wasn't gonna be on the pitch or have the same expectations that we were gonna have, mm. and I, I just felt like we we were indifferent, um, we were just not clicking or yeah, something. Yeah. I was quiet and anyway, but we just weren't. And would she leave? She would leave you alone. She yeah. would learn to leave you alone. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of guys, I think, um, a lot of guys, um, their wives would say the same mm. thing: just leave him be on match day. He's a weirdo. Right. <laughs> um, you said at the start there, just when you when you left, like it was such a tough time for for Ulster rugby. Like how difficult was that? Yeah, really tough, really tough. Um, uh, so on the pitch, obviously, we weren't performing, mm. and then you get to the point where you get into this cycle of of crisis talks, crisis meetings. Mm. On a Monday morning, someone would say, "Lads, we're not doing this well. We're not doing that well. Why don't we just knock it down? Let's do that. You mm. know, turn over a new leaf." And then you get beat. And then you turn over a new leaf, and then you get beat. And then to add to that, for me personally, I wasn't performing. I was, I was just feeling like I was starting to struggle physically. Mm. My back was giving me bother. A couple other injuries. Um, and then on top of that, then because of that, I wasn't getting selected. I was kind of in and out, mm. traveling as twenty fourth man to a lot of games, and I just wanted out of it. 
I just I just knew my time was up rugby wise. I was I mm. was done. Very very clear. Oh, it was time for me to move on and try something different, and I was excited about doing that. And has it worked out as you've as you'd hoped? Uh, so far, yeah, so far. Um, again, the the podcast stuff. Mm. Um, stumbled across that really. I d- didn't really plan that. Um, but I'm loving it. I'm loving. Yeah. I'm loving the the experience it's given me. I feel more confident. Um, the MC and hosting events, speaking in front of people. I feel like I've developed a lot of really worthwhile skills from that. Um, uh, and then it's uh, we're we're creating something that's a little bit unique as well, mm. which is uh, you know pretty satisfying. Yeah, yeah. Um, getting a decent bit of momentum as well. That and then other bits and pieces of media. Um, the, all that stuff that's ho- they're, they're hobbies and they're really useful yeah. there's a lot of transferable stuff that's going to be useful in business as well um, but the, the business the Keros is uh, something that I'm really excited about because um, it's something that, that I kind of came up with and uh, my business partner and I we got together and we, we got this thing off the ground and I find myself in meetings now mm. with designers and, and investors and um, stakeholders mm. and I'm just going. This is wow, this came from a, something that I had in my head. Yeah, yeah. And now it's becoming a reality. And um, people have, have invested in it. People are backing us. And uh, Ulster um, have brought it on board with them. They're a partner of ours, and it's it's very very satisfying to see the traction that we've had, and and it's satisfying and exciting to see hopefully where we're going to go as well. And has the doing House of Rugby has that? Do you think changed how people perceive you? I'd say so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say so. I think um uh I probably would have been mis maybe misunderstood mm. a little bit. Mm. Um uh but that's fine. Uh, I I would not be stressing about that too much. Um I just wanna kinda be myself because there's no point in trying to be someone else or going too far one way yeah. to kinda prove that you're not the people that people think you are. But I think a lot of people would have kinda pigeonholed me yeah, a little yeah. bit that's fine it didn't really bother me but uh i just it's it's a great opportunity to to sit down be really normal mm. have a chat um produce something reasonably creative and uh and i'm really enjoying it i can just see from how i can just hear barry laughing there as you say it's a great opportunity to sit down and be really normal <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. we just had a conversation <laughs> in the car about how we need to get weirder actually <laughs> okay really <laughs> yeah well, well how's that gonna go? um i think um <laughs> We, we we want to get like more move towards you know, the mighty bush or something okay, like that. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, at some <laughs> stage, we're gonna have to drop rugby. If that's the case. That's <laughs> fine. Yeah, that's fine. Um, look, Andrew, that was fantastic. It's great talking to you. Thanks for coming in. Thanks a lot for having me. Thank you. Well, that was Andrew Trimble, and this is Patrick Hawhey back in the room to tell us about the how to enter the competition. One one athlete in the chair after another. That's, how about that's what that? it is. Yeah. So I promised I'd come back to tell our listeners and our viewers how they could be under the chance of winning a pair of tickets to all of the gigs at Live at the Marquee Cork this summer. Um, David Gray, Versatile, uh, Christy Moore, Tommy Tiernan. There is a fantastic lineup and it's all thanks to our show sponsors, Carlsberg Unfiltered. Simply log on to our website, joe.ie forward slash Ireland Unfiltered. We've popped up a very simple question. Just answer it and you're in the draw. Couldn't be simpler. Brilliant. Thanks, Patrick. And before we go, don't forget to subscribe. Please subscribe on all the usual channels and we'll see you next week. Thanks. Bye.